Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And greetings from the Philadelphia Bar Association. Um, I'm so excited to be in a room with so many young people who look like me. I mean, I think that's part of it. Um, when we talk about diversity, first let me just tell you a little bit about what being diversity chair means. Um, about two years ago, the Philadelphia Bar Association looked around and realized that we did not reflect in enough numbers the reality of sort of the Philadelphia legal community and just the Philadelphia community generally. There wasn't enough um, people of color in our leadership pipeline and the Bar Association decided that there was something that we really needed to do with that, especially given what was going on because of the recession. Have you ever heard that expression, when America gets a cold, the black community gets the flu? Well, yes. that was happening within the legal community. And on top of that, because of the recession, um, many diversity heads were being let go from the, Phili from the Philadelphia law firms. And so the Bar Association decided that they wanted to be proactive and to change that. So two things that we did was one, we hired a director of diversity, Naomi McLaren, who was unavailable to come tonight, but I hope that you're happy that I came instead. <laughs> and um, they also appointed a diversity chair, which is a cabinet level appointment by the chancellor to really sort of be the voice and the outreach for the Philadelphia Bar Association to the outside community, but also within the basic legal community and say, we want you here and you're welcome. And besides being um, diversity chair, I'm actually also an elected member of the Philadelphia Bar Association Board of Governors, which is saying a lot because we are the oldest, most prestigious bar association in the country, but they actually had to sue about 20 years ago to make sure that we had spots on the Board of Governors to be appointed. So there's a lot of things that have gone on, but I am proud to say that I am a member of the Philadelphia Bar Association. I hope that all of you will think about becoming involved in the Bar Association and becoming leaders within the Bar Association because that's how we make change and that's how our issues are dealt with and talked about. So what does diversity mean? Because I think people talk about it a lot. Well, diversity is us, part of it. But it isn't just having us in the room, it's having us at the table and having those conversations and talking about the issues that are important to us. And the question is, how do we make diversity happen? Well, for, the, for us, the Bar Association and the legal community, we're trying to deal with some of the difficulties that come with dealing with diversity, which is we, as people of color, we have our own issues. As the Bar Association, we're expanding what it means to be diverse. So we're including senior attorneys. We're including attorneys that are disabled. We're including women attorneys. And it's not always sort of a comfortable conversation, but it's a conversation that needs to be had. And I know not that long ago, about eight years ago, I was a law student, and I listened to people come and visit and talk to us. And what I always wanted to know was, what was it going to be like for me, and would I have a job? And the question is, is that there is a great future for you out there. There's a great career out there in the Philadelphia legal community, in the Wilmington legal community, wherever you want to be, but you have to take it. No one's going to give it to you. It's that much more difficult for us. It's not impossible, but it is difficult. And I think that my story is sort of a success story. And so let me tell you a little bit about my journey, and hopefully that will be a help to you. So um, I always sort of get a little embarrassed when um, I hear my bio being read. Um, and I feel like I've come a long way. But the truth is, is that that's just a part of my story. That's not the underlying numbers. You can't tell by looking at me, but I'm a statistic. My mother was 19 years old when she had me. She was unmarried. My father left when I was two years old. And my mother was a drug addict and an alcoholic. And by the time I was born, two of my uncles had been stabbed to death on the streets of Detroit, and my grandfather had been killed before that. 
and those are the circumstances that I was born into. When I went to kindergarten, I, couldn't, I didn't know my alphabet. My kindergarten teacher, when my mom came to pick me up, said, Nikki's very socialized, but she doesn't know her alphabet. And my mother took me home that night, and she spanked me with an ironing cord until I knew my alphabet the next day. And that taught me a lesson, and it wasn't the lesson that she necessarily wanted me to learn, which was it made me afraid to show if I didn't know something or to ask for help. And it was something that acted its way out later on in life. Because of my mom's difficulties, my grandmother was sort of always the rock, and I know for a lot of people, if you're lucky, your grandmother was your rock too. She was disabled by the time I was about four years old, and she worked as a domestic, and she got a small settlement, and she used that money to move my family from Detroit to California. Um, but within a couple of years, all of my mother's issues came back with a vengeance, and my mother decided to move us away from my grandmother. Within a very short period of time, she had met a man, he took all of our money, and we went from living in a hotel to living in a motel, to sleeping on people's couches, to sleeping on people's floors, to running out of places to go. If anybody's seen that movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, that was very much what my story was like. You would wait in line and hope that you got a bed for the night. And many nights we didn't get a bed. And the nights we didn't get a bed, we would go and find a park bench and my mother would put me on one knee and my brother on another. And she would keep our eyes open and try to keep us safe. One of the positive things that came out of that experience was during the day when the shelters were closed and we didn't have any place to go, we would go to the library. And the library saved me. The books were my first playmates. And what it did for me is it gave me an opportunity to read about a different world and about a different life. And that's what fueled my dreams about being a lawyer. But the truth was, is I was afraid that that wasn't going to be possible, that I was gonna be homeless for the rest of my life. But after almost a year, my mother made the most selfless decision and probably the best decision that anybody made for me in my life, which was she realized that she couldn't keep us together as a family and she sent me to live with my grandmother. And when I went to live with my grandmother, I got off the bus, a Greyhound bus at about 11.30 at night, and it was dark. And I remember being scared and my grandmother hugged me to make sure I was okay and she looked at me and said, you were fortunate enough to be born in a different America than the America I was born into. And you're fortunate enough to be born to the greatest generation of women that will have ever lived. What will you do with this opportunity? Well, I was 10, and I went <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but what my grandmother did for me in that moment was she planted a seed and helped me to conceive of something greater than myself. And to understand me, you have to understand my grandmother because she's very much the legacy of which we are built upon and the legacy of some of the people who are much younger than she was that we will be honoring here tonight. All of the people that make it possible for us to make it possible for me to stand here and for you to sit there. All the people who sacrificed for us before people who didn't even know us. Who people like my grandmother who wasn't rich, who wasn't famous but wanted a different life and a better life and sacrificed so that maybe it would be different for the next generation. And we are the embodiment of that. When I went to live with my grandmother, she was disabled, she was living in Section 8 housing, she used welfare and food stamps to take care of me, and she had to sneak me in because it was a senior citizen complex and I wasn't supposed to be there. But the funny thing was, and it wasn't the first, it ended up not being the only time in my life that people who didn't look like me helped me. So California, it's very diverse. We had white people, we had Hispanic people, we had Asian people, and each week they would all claim me because only your grandchildren could stay with you one week. So literally one week, I was Asian. I was adopted by an Asian grandmother and I went by Nikki Wong. I kid you not. <laughs> and, you know, people helped me and the landlord looked the other way because somehow I think he knew that I wasn't Nikki Wong considering I was Nikki Lopez the week before. 
but that's that was the kindness that was shown to me and one of the things I learned for that was how important relationships were I was really fortunate to be with my grandmother and she taught me a lot of things that I hope that people in your lives I'm sure taught you because you're here and you're successful which was that education was the way out and that if I worked hard that I would have all the opportunities in the world and that that was something that education was something that people couldn't take away from me and the one thing she used to tell me she, there are two really important things that she told me that I would like to share with you which was she told me that there was no shame in being poor but being poor of character and that she said to me one day I think you're going to do something really great but your success won't be judged by your greatness it's going to be by helping other people to find their greatness and I think that's the sense of community that all of us need to embrace because no one gets here by themselves what the person you see before me is a lot of blood sweat and tears went into this a lot of sacrifice went into this and these aren't my achievements they're my grandmother's achievements they're my family's achievements they're the people who came before me they're their achievements and I worked hard but it wasn't the only thing so I ended up getting a scholarship and that's how I ended up coming to Philadelphia I got a scholarship to St. Joseph's University but it was very difficult for me and that's where the early lessons of not asking for help came into play and I promptly lost my scholarship and failed out of school within the first year and I didn't know what I was going to do I'm in Philadelphia I don't know anybody I lost my scholarship I called some of my friends and they said to me they said see girl you reached too high maybe you should have tried to be a secretary but that lit a fire for me because I said you don't know me and you don't know what I'm capable of achieving and that turned a switch on for me it turned my whole life around and what I did was I got a job as a live-in nanny on the main line for a Jewish family and it turned out they were lawyers the father was a law professor at Villanova and the mother was head of the ACLU so it was serendipitous I guess that was exactly where I needed to be and so that relationship has gone on for don't do the math um, <laughs> for 18 years and their son was three when I came to them and one of the things that they did for me was they helped me to believe that I was smart enough and talented enough to be able to go back to school and live my dream of being a lawyer but they also were willing to change their life around for me because I can tell you as a lawyer to be sure that you would be home every day by six o'clock to make sure that your nanny could go to school was a sacrifice and they did it for me they're fantastic people and there are people who also I'm part of I'm part of they take part of the credit for who I am and I'm so incredibly grateful for that and the reason I tell you that story is because when you guys leave here and even now you're gonna come across a lot of different people and I think we tend to gravitate towards people who look like us and there's nothing wrong with that there's a there's a comfort level but don't be afraid to be mentored and have relationships by people who don't look like you don't be afraid to have that relationship with someone who's white or Jewish or Hispanic because they might share the same values and understand you as a person in a way that maybe just because somebody else is black does it like nobody does this alone we all need help and support and especially for us we need the support of other people and so I went back to school um, graduated with my bachelor's degree went on to law school and decided hey I have nothing else to do I think I'll do my JD MBA and then and actually the reason I ended up doing my JD MBA was because my MBA was free they came to me no it's free who's gonna turn down a free MBA the beginning of um, the second semester of my first year Temple said hey we're trying to like get our numbers up if you want to come and get your MBA you have to take the GMAT you get a good enough score you'll get a free MBA okay but as you all know the second semester of your first year is kind of a busy time so I took it cold got a good enough score and then that's how I got into the JD MBA program and then 
the reason I ended up doing tax was I took a tax class, I liked it, but I didn't want to graduate in the middle of the year, so I said, hey, why don't I do an LLM? And they looked at me like I was crazy because they were like, let me get this straight. You want to try to do a JD, MBA, LLM in tax? Um, and I wasn't top of the class, I was a solid B student, B student in the house, I'll, I'll, I'll admit it, a solid B student, and truthfully, I failed out of college. So it wasn't exactly like that, those set of facts would make you go, yeah, this is the girl who's gonna be the first one to do that. But they had some faith in me, and it took about six months, but I ended up being the first person in the history of Temple University to complete that. And what I like to say about that is, it doesn't matter where you start, it's how you finish. And I know when you're in law school, it's difficult because people get in your head, and I'm not gonna say that grades aren't important, because they are, and you wanna get the best grades that you possibly can. But if you're not the top student, it doesn't mean that you can't be successful. And sometimes we think that that's the case. One of the things that I would say to you is work on making sure that you have the skills that you need. Make sure you are good, that you are excellent. And sometimes grades aren't going to be a reflection of your excellence, but be able to, be able to show that. And also, you have to be able to articulate what your value is and that you're good. And the truth is, is that you can do all of that and you're still going to have challenges. Because even though I left school with a JD, MBA, LLM, and tax, I kept feeling like the finish line kept being moved. Because people would say, huh, I never heard of that before. <laughs> or they'd say, three degrees? It just sounds like you don't know what you want to do with it. <laughs> and I was getting really frustrated because I felt like, well, wait a second, if I looked different, I felt like maybe there would be a parade down Market Street. <laughs> and, I was, and I had difficulty finding a job. But you know what? I decided in that moment that I was going to change the game, that I wasn't going to play their game, that I was going to talk about the stuff that was important to me, and that I was going to focus on the skills that I had, and that people were going to talk about the stuff about me that was important to me. And I think that's one of the things that I've been good at, and I think it's something that all of you have the opportunity to do. Because on paper, it's all about how you spin it. If, I, if you hadn't heard the bio, and I got up and said, you know, my mom was a drug addict, and I was homeless, and I failed out of school, those stats by themselves wouldn't sound like a superstar. They just wouldn't. But it's what I did with those things. And on top of it, I am a shameless self-promoter and have no problem saying that I'm good. But one of the things is, is I'm good. <laughs> I mean, part of that, and you're not going to be great when you first get out of school. That takes time. But I'll tell you some of the challenges that occur. So I'm a tax lawyer for the city. I work in major tax. And one of the things is, is I do taxes over $50,000. And because of that, I tend to litigate cases against some of the best tax lawyers in the city, in the state, and sometimes in the country against you know large corporations. And I remember my first couple of weeks at the city, I was just sort of getting my bearings. And a partner, an older white male partner from a large law firm comes in and looks at me and goes, huh. What makes you think you're qualified to be a tax lawyer? Was, no, hello. No, how are you? And I said, well, maybe my JD, MBA, LLM, and tax makes me qualified to be a tax lawyer. What you got? And so he was like, oh. And then he said, well, where'd you go to law school? And I said, Temple. And he goes, oh, I went to Temple. That's a good law school. And then, you know, we kept talking. And then he said to me, you know, I said to him, I was like, you know what, you don't really seem like you're serious about settling. Why don't you go back to your client and, you know, why don't we have another meeting and let's try it again. And he looked at me and he said, look, little girl, I've been practicing tax law since you were in diapers. And I was like, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> and so I looked him in the eye and I said, look, old man, you're closer to being in diapers than I am. <laughs> just like you and you will respect me. Now get out of my office. <laughs>
And I went to my boss, and my boss was like, what? <laughs> and he's like, well, that never happened to me. But he's a white male. But I held my ground, and I would not accept that lawyer back into my office until he apologized to me. And he went and told one of his other partners, and they were like, you were wrong. And he called me and he apologized and said, I have to admit, that was a pretty good comeback. <laughs> and, you know, the moral of that story was, that was six years ago. I had plenty of settlements with him then. I didn't take it personally. And part of what my grandmother always taught me is that success speaks for itself. Greatness speaks for itself. And so that's not typically how I deal with things, but if I have to, then I can. And that's what I want you to know. You guys are privileged. You are getting a fabulous education. And it gives you choices as to what you want to do with your life. And it garners respect. And sometimes you're going to have to pull and force people to respect you. But you're doing all of the things that you need to do. And so when you're thinking about the future, when you're thinking about what you want to do, I want you to think about who you want to be. I want you to remember why you came to law school in the first place. I want your choices to reflect the values of why you came here in the first place. And if money is one of your values, that's okay. Just be honest about that. But I know for me and a lot of my friends, you know, we came to law school, we thought we were all gonna get straight A's, we thought we were all gonna make $150,000 a year, and that's not exactly how it turned out. But you know what? It still turned out great. And I ended up where I was supposed to be. And it ended up in a place where I get to leave at five o'clock, and I get to, in a place that I get to do really interesting work, and Contrary to popular opinion, the, you can have a great career, you can have a prestigious career, you can have a successful career outside of being within a large law firm. And for any of you guys who want to be at a big law firm, I would love to help you any way I can. I would encourage you to do that. I've got to read the stats because that's what I'm supposed to do. But these numbers are really kind of difficult. So our Philadelphia numbers look like this. 19.33% of partners are women. Only 3.59% of partners are minorities. 1.27% are women minority partners. And in terms of the associates, we're doing better. Um, it's 47.41% of women are associates, but Part of the issue is they start leaving when they start having families because it's just difficult. 13.85% of associates are minority and 7.55% of associates are women minorities. And so those numbers are a little daunting. And it doesn't mean that you can't find success there, but if it's something that you don't want or you want to do something different, don't be afraid that you can't be successful and that you can't have a life and that you can't make money and that you're going to starve to death because you're not. <laughs> there's, lots of, there's lots of choices. I drove here in my Mercedes. It's used, but it's mine. <laughs> and I have a great quality of life. And most importantly, it gives me the ability to do things that are really important to me. So to do things in my community, to take time to go and do poverty work in India and New Zealand, and to talk about issues that are important to me. And so my career reflects the values that I have and what's, what is important to me. And so I want you guys to really think about if your, the choices you're making are going to reflect your values and to hold on to that. Because there's a lot of life out there and I know you guys are going to be really, really successful. And anything that I can do to help you, I would be happy to do. And the Bar Association would be happy to do. I hope I didn't scare you too much. But, um, you know, I still think, even with the economy and everything, it's still a really great time to be a black lawyer. And I think we can do anything and be anybody that we want to be. 
And again, like I said, the way that we honor the legacy, like the people that we're here to honor tonight, is to do our best. And not only to do our best, but one of the things I want to say to all of you and the challenge to all of you is to help others. And I see that you do a lot of stuff in the community and I want you to continue to do that. But I also want you guys to help and support each other because that's one of the things that we don't necessarily do the way that we should. And by helping someone else, you're not hurting yourself. You're bringing everybody and lifting everybody up. And that's what we need. And that's the best way to honor the legacy of all of the people who came before us. So thank you very much.